On this week's edition of New York Now, the state budget is due in about a week. We'll tell you where things stand with this week's panel. And Assemblymember Ed Ra, the highest ranking Republican on the Assembly Ways and Means Committee, joins us to discuss. Plus, a few capital updates. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. There's now about a week until the New York state budget is due on March 31st. And top lawmakers and Governor Hochul still seem confident they'll strike a deal in the next seven days. But they're still divided on some pretty big issues, like public safety. Hochul held a rare Capitol press conference this week to push her preferred public safety proposals, including a change to bail reform. Right now, if someone is charged with a bail-eligible offense, judges have to decide if they'll be held on bail or released. And the current law says that whatever the judge decides must be based on the, quote, least restrictive means. So some judges, according to Hochul, have taken that to mean that bail should not be set and that the person charged should be released before their trial. And Governor Hochul says that's led to confusion in the courts for some of these bail-eligible cases. So she wants to drop the least restrictive means language. So it's clear that judges can set bail in those cases. But progressives in the legislature disagree, saying that would lead to more people in jail who have not been convicted of a crime. And that's a pretty big disagreement to resolve in the next week. But Governor Hochul said this week she'd be willing to delay the budget to get what she wants. If history is an indicator, I think people know that I feel very strongly about certain issues, particularly protecting New Yorkers. That's what I'm supposed to do. So I feel confident we'll be able to achieve an on-time budget, but if we don't, it'll be because there are continuing discussions about matters that I consider extremely important. And on the same day, criminal justice advocates rallied at the Capitol against Hochul's plan. They want the bail law left alone and say that instead, the state should put more funding into pretrial services, diversion programs, and other jail alternatives. And they also want new tenant protections and health care funding in the budget. State Senator Jessica Ramos. Why do we want all those things? Because that is public safety. Because if you want public safety, if you're honest about wanting public safety, then you'll declare war on poverty. But Governor Hochul is getting some extra support this year. The Times Union and The New York Times reported this week that former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg has quietly funneled $5 million into a media campaign supporting Hochul's agenda. And that's not sitting well with progressives who want high-income earners in New York, like Bloomberg, to pay more in taxes to the state. And the idea would be to use that money to provide more services and relief to low- and middle-income New Yorkers. State Senator Jabari Brisport. It is so disgusting, so disgusting to say, I don't want to pay my taxes. I'd rather just throw away millions of dollars to try and force a budget that hikes fares on working-class New Yorkers, that raises tuition at SUNY and CUNY, that allows rents to keep spiraling up, that doesn't address spiraling health care costs. It is disgusting, it is deceitful, and it is selfish and greedy. Let's get into it with this week's panel. Anna Grunwald is from Politico, and Josh Solomon is from The Times Union. Thank you both for being here. So I want to start with this Bloomberg news, Josh. Uh, you had a story this week uh, kind of revealing this American opportunity thing. It's a pack. What is it? What's going on here? He, Bloomberg is spending $5 million to fund this direct mail campaign that has influenced the budget. Do we know why? <laughs> Before I say I revealed it, and I had it in Playbook yes, first. Yes, that is true. That is true. <laughs> I revealed a little more detail. Yes. Nick Fandos at the Times revealed the Bloomberg bit. Yes. And the so it's reported that Bloomberg's giving $5 million to someone to have a TV campaign, mailers, the whole deal, to support Hochul's budget. It's like top line items from it without getting into any of what the opposition is. Mm. What you see on the mailer is a DC address and it says paid for by American Opportunity. What's American Opportunity? They are somewhat associated with the Democratic Governors Association out of DC. It appears that they are running the campaign. They will not tell you that. 
they share a lot of the same staff. Though. They have the staff, the addresses, right. the phone number, the bank. Some of there, there's at least one TV ad that um, the the FCC information says Democratic Governors Association. So they're just gaslighting everybody. Uh, you can say that. I will say that. Yeah. <laughs> so they're all connected, and they're running the camp. They're, it appears that they're running the campaign. It's the same ad buys. They're using the same ad company that they did for Hochul during the campaign season. Interesting. So, Anna, you have covered uh, multiple budgets. What kind of impact can something like this have on this kind of process? If well, at all. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's unclear. I don't know that this has been done very regularly to try to get voters to influence their lawmakers to influence the budget negotiations, which yeah. are still kind of, um, I wouldn't say early because the budget's due in about a week, but there's still, <laughs> there's still a lot in flux there. Um, I think maybe this sounds um, a little bit too cynical, but it's hard to get people to even come out to vote. Yes. I can't imagine that explaining to them that there's some, some ideas being thrown around in Albany. You need to call your lawmakers about these specific proposals that even us in the press have difficulty um, deciphering sometimes. Right. We were just talking about before this, the least restrictive means thing with bail. And it's just so difficult for me to even explain it to our audience for television because it's such a complicated topic. And it's such an interesting perception. Why does Kathy Hochul need this right now? Right. I, I think there, there are a lot of hypotheses, but it seems like she could be uh, looking into kind of a tough battle. And I don't know if this is the perception she wants to put out there, that I need Mike Bloomberg's money to help me with my budget negotiations. What do you think that says about the dynamic between the legislature and the governor? Is this kind of like a, a divide, or are we just talking about more of the, the not far left, but progressive members versus Hochul, or the moderates kind of on her side a little bit? I think we sometimes like to blow up the ideas that no one's getting along at anything or everyone's really mad at each other all the time. Right. I think there are a lot of things that everyone can and will sit down and agree on. But there is an idea that um, that there's, there's a little bit of tension among the legislature, not only from Kathy Hochul's proposals, um, not quite as far left as some groups would want, but after this whole debacle earlier this year with her chief judge pick. Right, right. That has been quite the news story for the past couple of months. I'm interested to see if if that divide becomes more of a public real thing. You know, you had with Andrew Cuomo, whenever anybody went up against Andrew Cuomo, he hit right back, regardless of how light the blow was, anything like that, that they could never take a punch. With her office, I don't really see them that way. She has said that she wants to be a more collaborative governor. I don't know if that means that she wants to collaborate with progressives, but I don't know if She's going to go on the attack against them necessarily. Uh, one issue that is kind of defining this whole conversation is this bail reform debate that we were talking about. Josh, you's, you've covered this a lot. Um, the governor is seeking this change that she kind of thinks a, as a big change, the progressives think of a big change of removing least restrictive means. Do you see that as a big division in these final days of the state budget? We saw that last year with bail reform. Is it the same this year? Right. I think I said on the show recently that I wasn't sure how big of a deal it would be. It's yeah. obviously I was wrong. <laughs> I, it, it's 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 emerging to be a big deal. She held a red room this week. She brought out four moderate state senators earlier in the day. Four progressive state senators, including Brad Hoyleman Siegel, was a floor above railing mm -hmm. against her. Uh, you could see that you know the numbers games. How many senators does she have in her support? It's curious, but the the issue on the on bail, she says she's concerned about judges' discretion and wanting to kind of make sure that whatever we said the law is, that's going to be what it's going to be, and you can't necessarily every time there's a news story for the next you know 12 months, and you're saying, well, that person could have been held, but they weren't held pre-trial it's not going to be the state's fault. And that's kind of where it is. It's not shifting the blame, but it's saying this is completely on you, judges. It's, it's this, this issue is really ingrained in politics, I think, at this point especially, because 
Um, Republicans have done a very, very effective job of trying to connect the rise in crime to bail reform. There's no evidence that says those two things are connected. On the flip side, I think Democrats have had a lot of trouble trying to shine a positive light on bail reform. Um, you see criminal justice groups talking about how it's benefited people who don't lose their jobs because they don't get incarcerated before their trial. They get to stay with their families before trial, and of course they haven't been convicted yet. Um, it, it's just one of those issues that I don't know is ever going to go away. So I'm interested to see, this change would change one line of the law. I wonder if we have a bigger change next year or if it kind of fizzles, fizzles out after this. But we only have a few minutes left. I don't want to spend it just talking about bail. Um, I'm going to go to both of you. Over the next week, what are you watching? Like, what are these, what are these issues that the legislature and the governor seem to need to come together that we have to keep track of in the next couple of days? Uh, well, the big one, I think, especially according to the governor, is this housing plan that she's put out. Yeah. Um, I think it, she does want it to be a kind of legacy issue. Um, over the next decade, she wants. She says she wants to build 800,000 new units. Um, those numbers are flexible according to who you speak with. But the legislature says you can't really force these um, municipalities to build in this specific way. Mm -hmm. How about we just incentivize them to, and we give them some reasons to do it our way. And Hochul, I think, wants to go a little bit stronger. It's become a big fight, and there's so many different opinions on the best way to get this housing bill. I think everyone agrees on the overlying premise, but it's very, very complicated, and it could take a lot longer than a week to figure out a good housing plan for the state for the next decade. And I wonder if, because the housing thing with the um, allowing local zoning to be overrided, I think that's a, the big sticking point. I'm wondering if, if that does go through for uh, whatever reason, if Hochul is, is able to convince the legislature if there's just a lawsuit and it gets struck down. I feel like we talk about these issues sometimes, and then six months later, it's like it, it, that all was for nothing. <laughs> Jess, what are you watching over the next couple of days? I do think that the, the suburbs housing part of it may just be a bargaining chip of the of Senate Democrats or, or the legislature saying, well, you're going to have to earn that back. Yeah. We generally agree with you, but we're going to work out the details and you're going to have to earn that back. And I think that what's interesting on the housing front is both the Assembly and Senate chairs are in favor of good cause eviction, the top progressive priority. Uh, the mental health chairs are in favor of an 8.5% COLA, cost of living adjustment for workers. Those are some of the more expensive pieces or bigger ideas in the budget that the legislature wants and Hochul hasn't put into her budget. So that could be an interesting piece because it's not just fringe members of the, of the party right. that want it. It's the chairs of these committees. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, the budget is such a complicated, wonky thing. I wish we could talk about every issue that's involved in it, but I want to kind of open a, an open-ended question to Anna on the way out. Um, or Josh, you can answer too. But uh, <laughs> this is Governor Hochul's second budget. Last year, we saw a lot of things blow up in the last two weeks. Does it look like it's a smoother ride this year, maybe? You know, I'm not sure. I think last year, not only was it kind of a um, shorter timeline after she came into office and she had to get her budget through, but everyone's still trying to figure out each other's operating styles. Yeah. And so I think this year they're understanding a little bit more and people do seem to be talking more, but like we've already discussed, the dynamics are pretty fraught and everyone's still trying to decide how much they can needle each other and whether or not that will be effective. So I don't have a clear idea yet whether this seems um, better. We didn't know until nine days later last year, but I do think that people probably understand at a base level how to talk to each other a little bit more, so we'll see if that helps. I hope so. Josh, we're out of time. I'm sorry. Thank you both for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Grodewald from Politico, Josh Solomon from the TU. Thank you both. All right, sticking with the state budget now, if you were with us last week, you'll know that Assembly Speaker Carl Hasty joined us to chat about what Democrats in his chamber want to see in the budget. So this week, we wanted to bring you another perspective, this time from the other side of the aisle. Assemblymember Ed Raw is the highest ranking Republican on the Assembly Ways and Means Committee, the main committee involved in the budget. We spoke this week about this year's state budget, what Republicans want, and more. Assemblymember Raw, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Of course. 
So let's start with housing. Uh, you're from Long Island, you represent a district on Long Island where the governor's housing proposal has left a lot of people upset. Just to recap for our audience, she wants to build 800,000 new homes over the next decade, but the catch is one part of her proposal would allow developers to override local zoning laws to get it done if that locality is lagging behind its housing goals. Tell me what you're hearing on Long Island about that. Yeah, so just the concept of, of overriding uh, local zoning uh, is, is causing a lot of opposition. But really on top of that, it's been the transit-oriented uh, development piece of it uh, that also mandates a uh, half-mile radius around every Long Island Railroad station be rezoned to allow for 50 units per acre. So to put that into you know context from, I believe we have some something like 50 uh, stations in Nassau County um, I have 16 in or adjacent to my district alone, um, and it's a level of density that really you're not going to find anywhere in Nassau County currently. So it, it brings up a lot of concerns about, you know, water and, and roads and, and sewers and, and all of the uh, services that, that our residents uh, count on. So I don't want to misrepresent your position. It's not that you don't want more housing necessarily. You just don't think that this is the way to get it done. Yeah, correct. I think that, you know, trying to diversify our housing stock is important. Um, a lot of villages have done some innovative things, whether it's, you know, in their downtowns, uh, but have found ways to make it fit within uh, their community. So that's one of the really most difficult things about the transit oriented development piece is there are train stations that, you know, maybe there there is opportunity for housing there. Then there's other ones that are surrounded on all sides, that entire half mile is going to be currently single family homes and there's really no space there uh, to put you know, large buildings. So the Democrats actually came out with their one house budgets last week and actually pushed back on that zoning override part of the governor's proposal, saying that they instead want to offer incentives for new housing. So rather than kind of require it, rather than having it be a mandate, they want to incentivize that. What do you think of that? Is, is that a better way to do it or do you see a, a better way to grow housing on, in places like Long Island? I, I think that's a better way to do it. You know, it's more of a carrot uh, rather than a stick uh, approach. Um, but I, but I think too, one of the most important pieces of it of it would be having real infrastructure dollars behind it. You know, the governor's proposal has two hundred fifty million dollars statewide for infrastructure. Um, that's going to be a drop in the bucket. It, it's it's going to take a lot more than that um, to to make frankly, this type of housing viable in a lot of places uh, that don't have sewers. You know, how do you build uh, a multi-level uh, apartment building without sewers? Um, you know, and what impact does that have uh, on the environment locally? So I, I think the infrastructure dollars uh, would go a long way towards maybe allowing some municipalities to be a little more innovative. Yeah, you know, speaking of infrastructure, there's also a proposal in this year's state budget, which the governor and Democrats in the legislature are kind of agreed on, kind of not agreed on. It's the gas ban in new construction. And I know that's been an issue in areas of the state like North Country and, and Cattaraugus County in particular, where you have these rural areas that are concerned that if you cut off gas, then, you know, if there's an emergency, they might not be able to, uh, you know, cook food and heat their homes. Do you have those same concerns down on Long Island as well? I, I would assume that's something that would probably not sit well with local leaders there too. Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, when we talk about moving towards getting more green, um, I think too often, you know, we do it with tunnel vision without uh, making sure it's really a feasible thing. We should be, you know, I. Natural gas, I think, has become a really uh, important part of moving away from much less clean uh, sources of energy over the years. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I still to this day have constituents always, you know, looking to make those conversions. Um, so banning it for new construction, I think, is is going to, you know, when you go back to the housing goal, right? If you're if there are less viable ways of uh, heating these buildings and allowing the residents to cook and all that other stuff, uh, it, it makes uh, it makes that even more difficult to have development. You know, Republicans have also pushed back on this budget, saying that both the governor's budget and what Democrats proposed in their one house budget last week didn't include enough on this big issue in New York right now of cost of living. You know, it's no secret to anybody who doesn't have enough money to put food on the table 
that you really can't afford to live here a lot of the time anymore. Um, what do you think is the solution there if you were to put a proposal into the budget this year? Uh, well, we came out with a proposal last year, um, you know, that included the, the gas taxes, but also basically uh, included a, a sales tax moratorium on kind of those everyday items that people need, personal care items, uh, things like that, that people are buying on a regular basis to help uh, just with the inflation. Because, you know, as you know, when the cost of things goes goes up, the state almost is getting a windfall uh, because if the sales tax is a percentage. So if something doubles in price, the state's making that much more in the sales tax on, on that particular item. So I think a proposal like that could really help people uh, until uh, some of these costs start to come back down on those everyday essential items. Right. I mean, even outside of inflation, the cost of living in New York has been going up for a number of years. I mean, we've seen in the past decade, a lot of people move out of the state and, and some people will say it's the cost of living. Other people will joke and say it's the weather. But, you know, when it comes down to it, we don't know what each individual person is doing necessarily. Yeah. Um, do you think, you know, we talked about the state budget as this spending and fiscal document. And we like to put money into it and kind of take policy out of it. But you do have two months of session left after the budget. Is there anything that maybe the legislature could do on cost of living and affordability outside of the budget, you think? Or do you think that's a conversation best left in the spending plan? Well, I think there are things we could do outside of the budget. Um, but, you know, anything that's going to be some type of uh, tax break or sales tax moratorium or anything of that nature uh, is going to have dollars associated with it. So so that is best uh, left within the budget. But, you know, outside the budget, we can talk of perhaps about things like, you know, mandates, uh, you know, that that drive uh, local property taxes uh, up. Uh, you know, we, we've done some decent mandate relief uh, over the years with regard to Medicaid. But perfect example, we have in this budget this uh, potential shift uh, of Medicaid dollars onto our counties that could cause huge uh, tax uh, increases to our, our property taxpayers. So there's there's even the um, not just trying to move uh, forward with with trying to make it cheaper, but fighting against proposals like that that would have a negative impact as well. Before we run out of time, I want to turn to the governor's crime proposals and how the Democrats in the legislature have kind of responded to it. And it's a little wonky, so I'm hoping that our viewers have read up on this. The governor is proposing to take uh, out the words least restrictive means on bail eligible offenses when somebody heads to court for their pretrial decision from the judge. I know it's a little wonky, but the governor says it will allow judges to hold more people in jail before their trial based on some factors that they could look at. I know that your conference says that that is a good start. What else would you like to see? Are we still at the point where you'd like to see just a full repeal and start over? Or do you think maybe this is something that you do it in this budget, the least restrictive means part, and maybe follow up on it later? Yeah, well, I think the least restrictive mean part, the thing to remember is it has to be a bail eligible offense. So you're right. still dealing with that situation uh, that it's either on the list or not. And we always have these you know, cases where we fight, you know, something happens and then they say, oh, this wasn't bail eligible. So I think the, the real key to it would be actually doing a dangerousness standard um, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be a small number of people but that are coming in, in and out of uh, court on a regular basis so the judge can just evaluate that defendant, uh, their history, uh, and if they are posing a threat to public safety, uh, keep, them, keep them in jail as opposed to, uh, you know, having their hands tied like they do now. All right. Assembly Ways and Means Ranker Ed Roth, thank you so much for joining us this week. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. And a reminder that the state budget is due on the 31st. And sticking with the budget still, thousands of healthcare workers came to Albany this week to push for more funding for the state's healthcare industry. They want higher reimbursement rates under Medicaid, more funding for safety net hospitals, higher wages for home care workers, and a higher statewide minimum wage. And those are all ideas that Governor Hochul and the legislature more or less agree on, just not in the same ways. So we don't know where they'll land in the final state budget. But the legislature is pushing for more health care funding than what Hochul proposed in January. Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. We are fighting every day for you because we know you are fighting for us. I represent the Senate Democratic Majority. We have your back. More on that as it happens. 
And staying in healthcare now, as we told you, Governor Kathy Hochul is proposing a new strategy this year on mental health care in New York. That includes an investment of a billion dollars over multiple years for things like mental health housing, support programs, new insurance coverage, and more by mental health care workers who receive state funding and the chair of the Senate Mental Health Committee say Hochul's plan falls short. They want an 8.5 percent increase in state funding and an additional $500 million on top of that this year. They say that money would pay for higher costs from inflation and help keep and attract more workers in an industry with high turnover, partly because of the low pay. Senate Mental Health Chair Samra Brook. Right now across the state, we have a workforce crisis, um, but especially when it comes to mental health care. I've talked to facilities that have 40% vacancy rates for, the, for their employees. What that means, though, is that when any of us need help, there's nobody there if they're yeah. unable to recruit and retain their staff. So an 8.5% COLA, again, is the floor. Hochul has proposed a 2.5% increase, which workers say is too low. More on that as the budget comes together. But that does it for this week. Thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. by WNET.